Hi, Dr. Rob. Hi, Dr. Tammy. So our questions, our questions are, hi, Tammy, and hello from Alabama. That's great. <laughs> Thank you for being here, but we need questions. There was like, There's what, like eight of them up. last week? Yeah, you're cutting in and out. Are your earbuds not working? No, I'm good. I'm, 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 uh, they're fine. I had to fix a few things. Okay. I'm good now. Okay. All right. Well, so what? So how was your day, Tammy? <laughs> now, why don't we talk about really? something, you know, what these folks know, know, or they, I think they know that we do um, consultations for therapists and we meet once a week for an hour with a lot of these folks therapists, not talking specifically about them, but you know, how to work with certain issues. And I was wondering, should we pick one of the issues we work with if they don't ask questions? Well, maybe we have we a should... question now. We have a question now, so okay. save that thought, but yes, yeah. Right. And, and I was just telling somebody earlier today that, you know, because people want to do formal therapeutic disclosures on their own, and I was like, the most talked about conversation, the most talked about topic in the peer case consultation groups with people who do this work is formal therapeutic disclosure. So, okay. So and, my and essay doing has right been, and doing it wrong. Ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah. And how to navigate that. So we're getting questions. So we're good. Okay. My essay husband in recovery was diagnosed with OCD, not personality disorder and thought disorder in his psychosexual evaluation. His PA um, started in his porn addiction started in his early 40s after starting marijuana daily, married 18 years. Then we moved to a city for the first time, 20 years married. Within six months of increased porn use, he started visiting prostitutes and massage parlors, which were plentiful in the city. He's been sober from sex workers since D-Day and sober from porn since Lexapro kicked it. Mm. Kicked in. That sounds like a Is comment. There a so yeah. Question. I don't see a question there. So okay. Well, so, if you want to come back. You, Yes, if you have a question with that, great. So then, um, oh, should he be treated for OCD? That was the question. Okay, that's. Uh, there are certain things you have to do before you deal with recovery, not a lot. Um, for example, if somebody's drinking heavily, you're really hard to deal with sexual recovery if they're drinking. So you got to deal with the alcohol first. And, you know, in cases of mental health issues, um, I can't do the work that I want to do with a client until I realize, oh, they're obsessive. Oh, they have ADD. So for me, it, the, the psychiatric sort of is bigger than anything that I do. You know, addiction is a piece of it, but depression is a piece of it. You know, trauma is a piece of it. So, and I need experts you know, you may be a very good X kind of doctor, but if you don't fully understand the more complicated, you go to the, you go further up. So um, mm -hmm. I think absolutely you need to have as much psychiatric evaluation and follow those directions with someone you trust, um, not your family doctor. That's not who does this. You need a, someone who is a psychiatrist who can write medication prescriptions. But I, you know, I can be a little obsessive. I certainly have some depression and my life is so much better because I take medication. It doesn't feel good like drugs might, but I'm more stable. I'm more consistent. So yeah, I, I, my recovery is enhanced by having a, a brain that's working better. Um, and why make him work harder on his recovery than he has to? So yeah. Well, and okay. we've had, I want to yeah address this because we've had clients who've come to our recovery program. So the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles Treatment Program, and they wouldn't have been able to focus on the SA work until they had that stabilization. So, so like you're saying, they have to have that. I, I also like that you talked about, don't just go to your family uh, doctor. And even with a psychiatrist, it's best to have someone who understands addiction also, because not all of them are well-versed at that. So having like, when, when clients come to us, if they need you know, that evaluation, we have some um, a professional that we work with who's very good at understanding the addiction components, but also uh, addressing and assessing OCD, ADHD, all of those type of things so that, you know, that, that can be best navigated for, um, for the clients. And then hopefully they are able to, you know, concentrate, but, you know, we've talked about clinical depression, you know, uh, clinical levels of anxiety. Um, I, and, but I know AC, uh, OCD and ADHD are both problematic too. I, I also think that one of the things, and I will tout our horn for a moment, one of the things that we are really good at, but sadly shouldn't, 
shouldn't be needed is we've worked with people who've been through treatment programs. And mm -hmm. the thing is, if you're only looking for a certain set of se set of symptoms, like I'm going here for sex addiction, mm -hmm. sometimes they're focused so much on that, that they forget about depression or Asperger's or, or grief issues. Or so I think it's really important. I would want to make sure any place I referred someone really had a, a grounding, not just in addiction, but in mental health. And believe me, I know the Tammy will tell you the difference between a counselor who is really, really trained in mental health versus someone who's a coach or, you know, it, it, there's just no comparison. We are or an addiction therapist. We're much we are best guided by someone's mental health. So, yeah, good question. yeah. And well, yeah. And we've we've had many people who had that component missing that have been to, you know, even some major programs. So or so it's good that, to pay attention to those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, next question. When I'm feeling hopeless in helping her heal or have messed things up again, I find that sometimes when I am not being mindful, I will have thoughts that are not relational and would have me thinking about being a with a prostitute again or even dating somebody else rather than her. Is this my subconscious telling me that my relationship will not work or just my way of seeking comfort like I used to before discovery? I have to reread this. This is dense. I find that sometimes when I'm not being mindful, I will have thoughts that are. Can I? I'm not sure what is meant by I have thoughts that are not relational. Does that mean they want to act out? Yeah, they want yes. to act out. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so one of the I'm just going to throw something out there because I'm not. I, I like to think of things in a much more straightforward way. When I feel bad about myself and I feel shameful. Like I'm reminded of how I hurt someone and I start to feel, yeah, you know, I'm really a jerk. I want, I don't like those feelings. And so when I'm having those uncomfortable feelings, I don't, I, I, I want to run away from my partner and I want to go into my addiction. So even if it's just in my head. Um, so I really, I appreciate your saying this because underneath for all addicts is, is about separation or distancing. And so if you're not feeling close to her or you feel like you've let her down and you're the bad guy, addiction is a perfect place to disappear. And I'm not saying, saying to go act out. I'm just saying that, yes, this is a very logical, it's not your subconscious doing a whole lot of things. All it is, is you feel bad. <laughs> you, you know, it doesn't have to be deeper than that. And you feel separated from her, or you feel like you hurt someone you care about, and you want to go act out. So I wouldn't, you know, I, I have to say, sometimes people get a little too therapy-ish, and I love therapists, but sometimes our things just are what they are. <laughs> And in this case, yeah, um, you felt bad, you wanted to run away. I wouldn't judge anything or make any conclusions about your relationship based on that. But you might work on the shame issue. Yeah, I, I love that you're talking about that. And and you started with when I feel hopeless. So you started right. with I'm already feeling hopeless. So mm -hmm. there's probably some shame around that, you know, like, because I'm not doing this well enough or whatever. So yeah, uh, so speaking of that, so we have um, the um, attachment wound work group, and that addresses some of those those shame filled um, thoughts that will be starting again in September, I would invite you on the seeking integrity site under the work groups, you'll see that. And, and that, that those are some specific things out of the doghouse would be another one and how to rebuild trust and, you know, and hopefully gain some more um, insights or even just um, resiliency and, and not feeling hopeless, but yeah, I mean, like, sorry, but my, oh yeah, it's easy to go. Oh, that relationship won't work. Guess what? You'll go on to another relationship and you'll still have, you know, feelings of, you know, uh, something will happen and you'll still get into that hopeless. So, so I, I don't know ultimately if your relationship is going to work out, but if somebody else is sticking with you and they've been through all of this, that's a good sign. So, you know, working on the two of you, I just shared with somebody earlier today, Dr. Rob did a podcast on sex and relationship healing with Dr. Stan Patkin about we do the two of you together, rather than focusing on either of, you know, if, if both of us are focused on ourselves, you know, that isn't as helpful, but when we're doing things that are meaningful, that help the relationship, you know, and that can be you working on you and working on your shame to help the relationship. So, so, you know, like keep that in mind and you're not going to do this stuff perfectly. You are not going to help her heal perfectly. You know, this is, this is messy stuff, but you, you showing up here and asking these questions is a hopeful thing. And I'm really, I'm really glad you chose to do that. 
Um, I also want to add, Tammy, speaking of the mental health issue, and thank you for reminding mm -hmm. me, I am hopeless is how it starts. Some people, you're already sort of in the basement and you can't even get to the first floor because you had run into something like this and you're devastated by it. And so, you know, again, this makes me feel a little bit the other thing is, first of all, we're not hearing anything about what kind of support this person is getting. And also, you know, when I ask someone, someone says to me, is my subconscious telling me, I think, do they have a therapist? Like they're asking, do they have some, really, this is stuff you need support through with professionals. We're not making any money by selling it, trust me. But this is specialty work. You can't see a coach. You shouldn't see someone who's not trained in it. Um, this is the way you're going to get, really, even if you see them for six weeks and then you see them every other week for a while, just getting grounded in what this is all about. And by the way, I do want to give us some uh and I say today, props, I'm going to give us some props. We have courses online, like for the person who's feeling hopeless about being able to help her heal at the out of the doghouse course and book are available for the person who says, you know, I don't know if I can stay sober. What is sobriety? There's one of the sex addiction courses. Um, isn't there a, a partner? There's a partner. There's inner well. child. There's a betrayed partner one that started last week, Wednesday. There is room and other people missed, but then we'll start it again, probably in October. But you know, the, the inner child, the attachment wound, and we've got great resources that are, you need basic stuff, porn addiction, 101, sex addiction, 101, out of the doghouse for uh, men who've been caught cheating, the betrayed partner, couples healing from betrayal work group starts next month. So, so there's great stuff, but then that the, those deeper levels, okay, now I've got a foundation of recovery, but now I need to work on my inner child. I need to work on those attachment wounds, you know, the, you know, the betrayal wound, the uh, neglect wound, abandonment, whatever it is, there's always stuff, you know, so, so um, working through some of those issues, um, is really helpful. And all of the work groups are low cost so that uh, six week courses, 90 minutes, most of them couples is two hours, but, but they're, homework. they're geared. Yeah. They're geared to help you, you know, get that deeper foundation, not to replace a therapist. Many therapists do re, um, do request that their clients join these so that they have more information to take back to their therapist. It helps them get to that deeper place faster rather than just talking about what happened this week at therapy, you know? Well, I want to add to that by saying, if you are going to read an educational support group once a week, your spouse will feel better. They will know where you are on Thursday nights and that you're beginning to investigate this. But I did want to say one more thing about what this person said, because mm -hmm. it's so rich now that I can actually take it in, is that if you continue to walk toward your spouse and you're unable to figure out how to make it better, I've never met a man in my entire life, I've treated thousands of people whoever ha knew how exactly to either tolerate a woman being angry at him because he cheated or try and have a way to make it um, uh, them begin to restore trust. I've never known a man who intuitively doesn't just bring flowers and say, hey, is, it's been three months. When are you going to get over it? That is why I wrote Out of the Doghouse because I specifically wanted you guys, you men, to understand how long it takes to work through betrayal, what a, that a woman's experience of being cheated on is different than a man's. You know, um, I have so many men. We have men in treatment now, right now, Tammy, who say, "If my if my wife did this, I I wouldn't. I don't know how she puts up with it because I would have left a long time ago." So I do think out of the dog has to really, really um, encourage men who get discouraged because you're not sure how to heal or show empathy or compassion. Yeah, that's something you can learn, I promise. So anyway, that's why I did that. That's why we teach it. And I just wanted to put it out there because it's one of my favorite courses. And I do know male partners of both female and male addicts. And they, like I, I was speaking with someone today and I was like, wow, the, this person was in the relationship and really doing the work. And like, I have great hopes for the two of them. I see good things. So, so regardless of the situation, there is hope, there is the ability to heal if you're both willing to do the, you know, get the support that you need to, to do it. So, okay. Oh, right. um, next question. Is it common for a PASA to say to their partner that they don't trust them because most wives of husbands who have cheated on them would cheat back? Hmm. Crazy that this would be coming from someone who risked his family to be in a long distance, inappropriate relationship with a married woman who happened to be my cousin's wife. But now after what he did, I am not trust. I, the partner, am not trustworthy. So I think the person already knows the answer to this. Um, really, they already know that the person you 
are uh, that your husband, I guess your partner is doing everything they can to say, look over there, <laughs> look over there, that's the problem. And that keeps you from, that keeps you guessing. You know, should I be angry? What should I do with my anger? You know, because you've been thrown, you've been gaslighted. This is someone who's, who is um, lying to you in order to distract you. And then you're confused and you don't, they don't want you to be really angry at them. So this is, I, I admire you for your sanity in a situation like this because you sound very sane. And the reality is there's, there, all of this is, is an attempt to keep any, both of you from looking at the problem and to keep getting in trouble. And it's a, it's a ploy, don't pay attention to it. This is a good example of a sex addict being manipulative. Um, and yes, you're angry, but you're also confused and questioning yourself. And you know what, this is a man, because I know addicts, who knows exactly how to get you to doubt yourself and not and question your own anger because you're together and you know each other. So um, I don't know, Tammy, you might have a completely view, different view. No, but I say, I, like <laughs> this, give it a raz. Okay, right, this occasionally comes up. Um, but it always feels like blame shifting and, and that, you know, that shell game of, you know, of, you know, where, what, what's under the shell, which, which one is it, you know, it does keep you, you know, it keeps the, the blame off of him. The, you know, he's, I don't hear any, I'm taking responsibility for what I did. So to me, this would be, you know, a, a real clear definition of that person. My PASA has the problem. Yeah, I'm taking care of me. I'm putting up healthy boundaries for me. And, uh, you know, and you said, I mean, how tragic that, you know, he risked and, and the other person too, but, but he risked his family, all of everything, you know, and is now trying to blame you. So it's nothing you did or didn't do. You, you're fine. You know, yourself, you have integrity. It's, it's him. So. And Tammy, you know, what's great about this question is that, um, that whole thing we talked to spouses about trust your gut. If mm -hmm. you read through this, like um, mm -hmm. with a married woman who happened to be, and I'm sorry, this is any relationship yeah. to your family, but yeah. inappropriate. I mean, there's a lot of anger in there. And I have a feeling like yeah. this person's gut says, I'm furious, but they're questioning that and they're being led to question that. And this is why I say to spouses, trust your gut because there's something going on that doesn't make sense because it doesn't. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get off my toadstool here. Go yeah, ahead, yeah. And, and uh, I hope you have good support for you. And I'm sorry, you're, you, you, you and your cousin, unfortunately. So, okay. I'm a betrayed partner feeling guilt and getting some backlash from my time post discovery and reaching out to friends and family during my emotional crisis. My sister now doesn't feel comfortable being with my husband. This, I hear this all the time. This is why you have to be careful who you share with. I understand, but at the same time now I feel torn to choose. How do I manage the fallout of oversharing in hindsight, I wouldn't have, but needed support and can't change the past. You are right. I wasn't trying to, you know, add anything to that. So, um, why don't you start that, Tammy? Because you I was going to say I have, a, yeah, I've, I honestly, unfortunately, deal with this too often. So, you know, at some point, you know, you pick who is safe. So, you know, if that family doesn't feel comfortable being around your husband, that's fine. They're not safe for you either. You know, or if if you do feel a closeness or there's some reason for you to be in that, then and right now your husband's, you know, in the doghouse, as Dr. Rob has said. But I think it's also, you know, it's okay for you to, to verbalize, I needed support. You know, if you can't be, you know, supportive of me, knowing that I was in a crisis, that, that's okay, you know, but then I need to not be, you know, I, I need to not be in close proximity to you at this time. I hope that at some point we can resolve this, but for right now, I really need to do what I need to do to take care of me. And, 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 I, you know, um, there was an old exercise that was like people in the rings around you and the closest mm -hmm. people to you are the ones that can be supportive and can show up and not try to you need to get rid of him you need to dump the bum but just go what do you need um, how can I support you whatever that is and then there's people that are layers out right now your sister may need to be in one of those outer rings and it may be temporary it may be more permanent but you know trust your gut on who you actually can um can share with you won't do it perfectly you know I've got people in my past that I shared with and you know it didn't work out but you know I go ahead I'd rather I'd rather try and have it fail every now and then because most of the time you know most of the time people have been able to you know to support me and me them so um you're right you can't change the past here's where you are now 
you know, hold your boundaries, you know, uh, people that need to be out a little bit, they need to be out a little bit. I wanted to say something about the rings that you mentioned. I'm glad you said that, Tammy. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, a simple way of thinking about it, we can just stay a ring and you're in the middle mm -hmm. of it. And the people that you feel most safe with are in that ring. And you tell them you're most open with them and most honest with them. And you trust them that they're not going to make you feel bad for what you said. They're not going to tell anyone mm -hmm. else, you know, for me, this is my niece. This is my wife. This is, you know, people who just fit in there. Um, and I think you reached outside outside of that ring and let some other people know who weren't as safe and that you know no harm no foul you didn't know any better and i really appreciate your being so vulnerable here and saying gosh i wish wish i'd gotten it right because like any partner you have the right to feel angry and furious and hurt and entitled to or whatever i do is what they deserve you know so i really appreciate for the folks who are still dealing with a lot of their anger that you are willing to say, hey, maybe that wasn't the best move because I think that's a good thought. And by the way, in the future, if I were in that place or for anyone who's listening, I would just check it out with someone. You know, I want to tell everybody, not, not the person who hurt you, but somebody, you know, you really trust. And should I do that? You know, just getting that support and that feedback. But I did have one other thought. Tammy will like this one, I think, that this is how you know, this is when you, well, there's two pieces. One, one of which is this is when you know who your friends are. Because this is when the people who love you, they either bring it up and say, you know, darn, I, that, that's really confusing, but we talk about it, or you bring it to them and say, as, and this is where you have to be stronger, you know, we've been through some uncomfortable stuff, we don't need to talk about it, but we just want to acknowledge, you know, it is about where you have the real honesty and the real trust. And this is, believe me, the people who want to talk superficially and pretend it never happened, they're not where you need them to be right now. The people who you're afraid that now that they found out they're gonna this, that, and the other, don't spend your time with those people right now. Spend, it may be a small group, but spend your time with the people who really don't care about your challenges, just love and care about you. Because everyone is going to have something to say. You know, Aunt Susie's gonna have something to say, your sister's gonna have something to say, you know, all of that. And granted, it will not, there'll be some, Thanksgivings that won't go quite as well as you might have wished, but um, uh, but this is really when you get to see who loves you and accepts you and doesn't give a darn. Um, so anyway, thank you. Great question. Well, and I was thinking, you know, a lot of it is their fear. They don't understand. They don't know, and so they don't know what to say, or they have a misperception of what you know sex addiction is. You know, what like you know they automatically go to the offender, you know, side of things. Um, uh, so, so I think, but I do think if you haven't already been there on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, we have support groups for betrayed partners. You can say just about anything there. In and a, they're free. You know, in a supportive, yeah, in a supportive manner. And I mentioned the, the betrayed partner work group. Again, great support, great education to help you process through some things as well. But if you don't have a, a specific support person for you to help you work through the betrayal trauma, Email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Let me know what you're looking for and where you're located. And I will do my best to help you find um, the right support to help you. So and I, I you are not alone. More. Lots of people have weathered this. So you can do it. You know, but there'll be some awkward at Thanksgiving, et cetera, but take care of you. So go ahead. And that's what those groups are. For. They're, they're mm -hmm. free. And this is what they're for. So that you can talk to other spouses and say, you know, you told your kids, you told, how did you handle it? Um, but I just really feel bad for you on some level because now you're challenged by your betrayed partner and you're also challenged by what's been said and all the, how you might feel uncomfortable with all these people. So you have a lot to grieve and be challenged for by. I hope you have a lot of support around you or you find some. Okay, what do we got? Okay, well, so I'm going to skip one. Going back to the person who was feeling hopeless says not really acting out, just thinking about another woman. And I'm like, hmm, that doesn't feel like a really, that sounds like a middle circle behavior to be, you know. I have to, to go all the way that. back to the first, the beginning so the, of that. So if you go back to the answer, it was uh, when I'm feeling oh. hopeless and I and helping her heal, it's that question. Oh, that one. Uh-huh. Yeah. So that's, I just want to tag in. I was like, but, but, I'm sorry, but that feels a little bit like denial. I'm not really acting out. I'm just thinking about someone else. Well, that's, you know that probably is a less than helpful thing to help her heal, so. 
Anything okay. else to add? So no, I'm just okay. trying to get, I just got through that okay. part. I'm very okay, slow, so, you have to understand. I got so it, no, I Okay, I'm going to. And what is the last part? Seeking like I used to before discovery. What's the part that just came what? in? I just said, not really not acting really out, just, acting thinking, out, about just thinking about another just woman. Just thinking about another um, woman. That's in the answer. Yeah. Oh, that's in the answer. I just moved it to answer. Sorry, you guys. It's okay. Like <laughs> no, it's one. okay. So, I'm just, so now they're I both in answer. I was going to go to the next one. Right. But. Not really acting out. And the one that starts with, I'm hopeless. Is that right? Sorry, I'm guys. I'm hopeless. I, yeah. Yeah. So okay, if you go up to so, 507 and okay, the you'll have to tell 502 me if I got go together. Right. Tammy, I mean, you have to tell me if I did this right. But um, okay, I don't think this is any different than what we answered before, which is you know you are going to a place to feel better and where you can mm -hmm. feel more comfortable. And I don't think it means anything. You know, um, when I I wanted to go back to that when I um, I'm still trying to put these together. Um, oh, okay. First of all, I, I would really suggest you don't tell your spouse that you're thinking about, and this is not something to share with your spouse. Let me just make that really clear. Every thought that we have that goes through our head that is uncomfortable around recovery, we need to tell our sponsor or our therapist or someone, our clergy, whoever we're working with, but not necessarily our spouse. And spouses, that doesn't mean we're going to leave anything out that's important to you, like acting out. But we don't want to trigger you every time we think about something sexual or see someone that we find attractive. So um, just, and back to the attic, just because you're having this feeling and this desire to me, it's just, again, a, a desire to escape um, and focus on something other than what's going on in the moment. And I'm really sorry, folks, that I get so confused about. Tammy knows I'm not skilled with, um, I'm good talker. <laughs> yes. And yeah, so, so to me, if you're focusing the thoughts on, oh, sorry, on someone else, you know, like to me, there's an opportunity to pick something that's healthy for you rather than, you know, starting to go down that path. So I would encourage you when you're thinking, oh, should I, I'm hopeless and I'm not, you know, sh is this relationship going to end? Let me think about that other woman. Th there's no good can come of that in my opinion. So I would encourage you to go, what can I do? You know, if, if you're not looking, but you're kind of fixated on something else it's kind of like the three second what do i need to do to shift my attention you know so that i'm not you know and i'm not you know over fixated on that so okay we have Next so question. many good questions yes, yes i know i want to keep although I, okay I have one hi question, there which is let's go fast we have a lot of questions okay okay hi there i'm the betrayed partner my partner and i had another discovery oh this past week wednesday he He's an admitted essay, but was never sober during the time he led me to believe. I'm not only heartbroken, but struggling with intrusive thoughts during intimacy. Our sex life has always been a treasure. How do I cope with this? At this point, I can barely sleep in our bed. I would love some tools to deal with the midnight trauma thoughts. Well, I, I feel badly that you feel in any way um, that either you want to be intimate or you should be intimate with this person. I, again, this is so, so about trust your gut. Your body is saying, I don't want to do this. I don't feel uncomfortable with this. The, the intrusive thoughts, you know, they mean something. You have to pay attention to what's going on inside you because, you know, everything in you is saying, get this person away from me. And, and, you know, they could sleep in another room. You do not have to sleep in the same bed. This person has hurt you. And then they lied to you on top of it. And I don't feel like you have a responsibility to make sure he's comfortable because he has to sleep somewhere else. Um, he's lucky he's in the house. So, but I, and so I just want to validate, yes, you're going to have intrusive thoughts. No, you're not going to be able to sleep. Um, yes, you're going to wake up at midnight and all of that. And all of that is because your body is telling you, get this man out of my bed. And by the way, I say this all the time. It's one of my favorite statements. Um, I ask people, would you sleep, would you have sex with someone you don't trust? And, you know, they usually think of a stranger and, oh, I would never have sex with someone I don't trust. Well, why would you have sex with the person that you live with if you don't trust them? And so, you know, if you don't feel trusting, which I wouldn't at this point, then um, I would respond to that and trust myself that there isn't a reason to be trusting and act on it. You have to take care of yourself. I guess I feel real protective right here. You have some thoughts, Tammy? Because yeah, no, I, I do too. But I was like, you know, so, so this thing that was a treasure to you has now been, 
broken. And, and I will share from a personal standpoint, and it wasn't because my husband was unfaithful, but I had a huge betrayal and I had nightmares and I, they lasted like eight months. And it was my mind processing through that. And when I stopped having nightmares, I would wake up cold sweat. But um, when I stopped doing that, I was like, and I was working with a therapist, I, you know, I had the support, but it was just, it's a process. That's all I'm saying is, you know, like Dr. Rob said, trust your gut. It's like, it's a process. You are going to have to, well, you don't have to, but it would be a natural thing to grieve, you know, over this loss, this loss of what you thought you had, the treasure you thought you had with your sexual intimacy and intimacy is not sex. All the sex addicts can prove that to you. So, so, the, but the vulnerability, the closeness that you experienced, which was, a, was part of your sex life, you know, it was for you. I, I don't know, you know, what it was for him, but can you get that back? Yes, eventually, but only if he's willing to do the work. I mean, he's lied to you. So in fact, we have a treatment program. He's the kind of guy that would really benefit from, you know, I mean, we help the guys get a foundation of recovery and stop lying to themselves and everyone else. So um, you're too. not alone. Yeah, he, I no, he really does. <laughs> yeah, he works directly with, you know, the clients who are there and um, it's really meaningful for I, them. I just so. want to say this person also, you're, there's a lot of grief here. Um, our sex life has always been a treasure. And like Tammy said, you're not just talking about sex. You're talking about, how, even if you don't have great sex, there's still a connection that happens when you are sexual, unless you're really, really uncomfortable or not feeling. But when sex is good and it's loving in a long-term relationship, it's amazing. And so, and, the, and it is a part of intimacy. It's not intimacy, but it's, it's a part. And so when that goes away and you're angry and hurt, you have to start looking, well, what do we have? You know, do we just have the past or so? Yeah, I would be very disturbed in this situation. And by the way, there isn't anything about I'm going to a support group. I'm going to therapy. Um, you know, I, I, I think no matter what your spouse do, does, you need support. And um, Tammy, you know, would you mind typing in? There's so many folks who didn't really know where those support groups are. Would you mind? No, we will. don't charge for them. They are free. We get lazy therapists to volunteer their time. No, I, I'm being sarcastic. We get they're therapists not lazy. Dedi yeah, yeah. They're dedicated to, they're really dedicated for their own reasons, like we are, to making sure that people get the help they need. And so they volunteer, oh, like eight or 10 of them to do groups every week. And there's betrayed partners groups and there's addicts 19. groups. And we have 19, 19. groups. Are you serious? And, yes. Like you haven't, yes. Like you have no idea how many, I sent an email out to people a couple months ago and there 19 were 19 groups. people and that doesn't include the webinars. That's just the drop-in group. So we have amazing non-lazy people that are wow. helping out with this. This is, uh, yeah. So it's, it's awesome. So yeah. And, they and they're it. dedicated, like they've been doing it for, you know, a number of them have been doing it for a long time. That's why I did in the know. rooms. There's something very rewarding. Anyway. Let's keep moving, moving. Okay, next question. Um, uh, hello, Dr. Rob, I'm a PA and SA working on my recovery and for uh, sober from chem sex for three years, yay. Still working on porn addiction with my sponsor. I suffer from performance anxiety due to overthinking, which I understand escalated <laughs> my sex addiction to chem sex because I couldn't perform. Now that I suffer, my performance anxiety is still an issue which affects my recovery. Which are, what are your thoughts on dealing with performance anxiety? I'm on well butrin, but it's not helping much. Um, when this is when you say performance anxiety, is that like erectile dysfunction? Is that what you're thinking, Tammy? Um, something like that. Let, let's go with that, or any kind of. I just get anxious and have a you know have challenge. So yeah, I don't know. Well, I, these are a lot of different pieces. I can tell you that. Let me just take one piece at a time, and maybe Tammy could grab some is that um, we are not good with intimacy. It's scary to us. And many of us have abuse or other kinds of histories that where you would think, oh, I love this person. I wanna get close to them. We end up um, getting scared or angry, upset and actually backing away. So I'm gonna throw one thing out there, which is you know, there might be, I'm a therapist, psychological issues around here that directly relate to things that have happened to you. Because if you're an addict and you're a drug addict and you're struggling with sexual intimacy, then there's something going on underneath all that, that really, those are symptoms. The sexual acting out, the porn is certainly the chem sex. By the way, chem sex will kill you, especially if you're not 25. They will kill 25 year olds, but the men I work with are 50 and they're gonna have heart attacks and strokes and stuff like that. But in any case, um, 
I, I, I the whole overthinking, um, it feels to me like there's, how do I say this? Many of you spouses will say, now you're not acting out, but you don't seem to want to have sex with me. And that's because it isn't about you. It's that intimacy is scary and difficult for us. And by the way, one of the things I would say if I had performance anxiety would be, do you tell your spouse, the person you're with, do you say, you know, I'm worried that this won't happen, or I'm worried that the, do you, when it happens, do you say, I'm really embarrassed, isn't where, you know, what, how do you, how do you talk about it? Do you just walk away with, away from it? And there are sex therapists who deal specifically with these issues related to sexuality and erectile dysfunction. I am actually, I have a PhD in that. So it's another thing you can reach out to Tammy for T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com is because we work with an educator in that uh, arena and we know really good sex therapists all over the country who are not, who understand sex addiction. Um, but to me, there's a psychological, a lot of psychological issues here. So Tammy, how about the drug? Yeah, well, and I, well, I'm glad you're free from the drugs. You know, that's really good. But, but you know, the porn, if you're still, if you're still um, utilizing porn and that's keeping the dopamine going and all of that, then it's hard to really get to those underlying issues, you know, that really can help. So, uh, so, so there's so much here. I would, I, what you I don't hear is, yeah, I was going to say, I don't hear a qualified CSAT therapist that can address this and ideally one that also, you know, uh, uh, is, as Dr. Rob mentioned, yeah, works with trauma, but works with, you know, sex, sexual health too. So, so and I want to say that, Tim, oh, I'm sorry, Tim. I, I just want to say like, neither one of us are here to make a diagnosis. And neither one of us are here to say, this is what you should do to see a doctor, don't see a doctor, whatever. You know, I think you need to get more feedback than just Tammy and I have to give. So when I say I sense psychological trauma issues here, that's from reading something. And, you know, it's also my gut doing so much of this work, but you might have depression. <laughs> you might have, you know, a whole bunch of issues. Um, when we're working on our recovery, they all come up. So I really do encourage you to see a qualified professional who can help you sort through these things to understand how they fit it together because I have a feeling they mm -hmm. do. So yeah, I do thank too. You. So okay. Betrayed partner here, my SAPA husband relapsed and then a couple weeks ago oh, later slipped. I asked him to provide me with the things he is going to do change. He is committed to his treatment plan to help me feel safe moving forward. He is seeing a CSAT, has a sponsor, goes to 12 step meetings, watches webinars, does alumni meetings. So he's been to our program. He says he does not want Sounds to perfect. share because I will use it against him if he doesn't do it. I tell him that's accountability. Please explain that my request is legit. Well, you know, I'd like to eat cake and ice cream every night and not gain any weight. I would love if that happened, but unfortunately behaviors have consequences. And if I am struggling, you know, uh, so many addicts are afraid of, a, and I do this with you, Tammy, are afraid of a woman's anger. You know, when a woman gets angry at me and I think I know where it comes from, I just kind of shrink up and I, I'll tell them anything just to go away or I'll try to please them or, you know, or I won't say what I need, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, it's no surprise that a lot of us have family issues and we struggle with both genders. And the biggest issue we often struggle with as addicts from where we come from is being assertive especially in the face of an angry woman in my experience. <laughs> so, um, you know, in this situation, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, I would imagine that he's terrified of your anger and he really is, um, that's my guess. And he wouldn't know how to handle it and doesn't know how to handle it. So um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have it. I'm just, and, and he deserves the responsibility for what he did, but it's sometimes really hard for us to be honest in the way we need to. So I don't know, Tammy, how it, should she handle this? I, I, to me, it's, I, I need you to understand that I want to like the slip, um, you know, he came to you because that means a slip is he came to you, the relapse is he didn't tell you and you found out or whatever, but you know, I, and it's hard. I, I honestly, I remember um, w when my child was young and I said, if you tell me the truth, you will get in less trouble than if you continue to lie. You know, I mean, that was a hard lesson but it was, you know, within elementary school age child, but just, no, 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 I'm just, it, no, but it how old is an addict? Or, 
I know exactly like, this, yeah. this resonates is like, I'm afraid that I'm going to get in trouble. And, you know, and the, you know, but it is the accountability. I'm with you. There needs to be accountability. He says he does not want to share because I will use it against him if he doesn't do it. Well, then just freaking do it. You know, like that's the, that's the accountability. We, you know, being in integrity, being in recovery, we do what we say we're going to do. That's, you know, that, and Dr. Rob talks about that in Out of the Doghouse, which would be a good group for him to go to, um, to start with. Um, but, you know, he talks about, you know, if you say you're going to take out the trash, you take out the trash, you know, you don't lie about it. You don't ignore it. You do what you say. Now, do we forget sometimes? Yes. But then we come and say, oh, I forgot to take out the trash. I'm going to do it now. You know, I mean, there are ways to clean up. That's what the 12 steps are about, you know, he's, he's going to 12 step meetings. Hopefully he's working the steps. Cause if you just go to 12 steps, you're not really making progress. It's doing the steps, but it is accountability. I take an inventory every day. That's what the 10th step is. I make amends if I need to, you know, and so there is a way to clean this up early in recovery. It's really hard. He's going to make more mistakes. You holding the, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to encourage you. I want to be here. I want to support this, but here's what I need, you know, and I'll be in this process with you. If this is where you can show up, Debbie McRae did a great job with some about boundaries for, for betrayed partners. And it's like, I, you know, if you're unable to make this safe space for me, then I'm going to withdraw. That's not what either of us wants, but, but for my safety, that's what I need to do. So, so it's like, I hear you saying that you're not willing to be accountable. Then I need to create safety for myself. And this is what it's going to look like. And when you're able to help, you know, help, walk step into that space then I'm going to be able to be you know closer to you too so you know but communicating and I and I I know what Rob says you know the and the anger can be intense even if it's perceived disappointment um but but you know that's it goes right back to shame it's you know we so have I want to, to just overcome offer, our shame because Tammy and I are very much like dive into the problem and you know be direct yeah. and I want to yeah. say, I just want to speak from the addict's pers uh, point of view for a minute. I wonder if you could sit down and have a conversation when you're not angry at each other, when you're not upset with each mm -hmm. other, and really say, I did this yes. this morning. Let's put our upset aside. I know we're going to feel it. Let's just keep in our heads here and, and say to him, tell me if I can understand what does it mean when, you, when, I, when I use something against you? What is, does that mean I keep repeating it? Does that mean I keep bringing it up? Does that mean I, you know, what does that mean exactly? I tell my friends, um, I think it's important for you to find out what does that mean? Because it could simply be a little turn of how you're communicating. And as Tammy and I have talked about, you know, it's best to take some time each evening and have this conversation rather having it all day. He may feel like, God, no matter what I do, I, that's going to get thrown in my face again. I, I don't know what it means to him, but I want to be fair to, us broken people as well and say, you know, maybe sometimes we don't understand, we want it to be better. We don't know how to make it, make it better. And if you are open to saying, I, I want you to feel more comfortable and safe, even though I'm angry, let's talk about that. I think you'll get really, really far. And I see Tammy nodding her head. So I feel good about that one. Yeah. Well, no, and I should have said, like, you talk about this, not in the moment. I like, so I'm so glad you brought that up. And you know, that, that is like, we, and it, it, uh, we talk, you know, as a team too, about being curious, it's really helpful to be curious, so that you understand what some when someone's saying, you know, this, it, you know, I need to understand and have clarity about what what it what are you really saying? What does that mean to you? All of those things. And then we have a better understanding rather than, you know, getting hackles up or something. So, so but I always find it better to talk, not in the heat of the moment, you know, about things and and I do find having a set time, you know, um, journaling about it. If there are some things that you just need to talk with your therapist about, because having a mediator to help you navigate that could be really useful too. So, I also want to add one more thing, which is there are two separate issues here. There's what he has to say or not say, and then there's how you guys are working on talking to each other. And I, they don't have to be the same conversation. You could sit down yeah. and say, we're just going to talk about what you mean by I'm going to use it against you. And later, because you don't want it to spill into, okay, now that we've decided how to do it, you need to do it. That, that would miss the point. So anyway, 
Thank you. That's a great point too. Okay, next question. Our CSAT is telling us that disclosure will be scheduled when we are ready. SA has submitted an updated written disclosure, but still not scheduled. Originally told one month after SI, but the date has passed. Does that seem reasonable? I'm getting a little confused because it sounds like you have one CSAT rather than two. Um, I would like, I, I would want to have both CSATs on the same page that both of you, each of you has the support and are ready. And honestly, I like one other point and I'll turn over to Dr. Rob, but you know, like right now, I mean, the therapists, I, I'm having a heck of a time finding therapists because everybody's full. So I don't know if it's a scheduling issue as well, but it'd be worth asking, but okay. What are your thoughts, Dr. Rob? Well, as you said, Tammy, I, it, it's a completely different situation, whether this couple sees a couples therapist who's doing it with both of them, or they ha each have the support of working with someone separately. I think those are different. So I'm not sure about this one, but I will say that um, when I would start to see uh, an addict, I would say, you know, disclosure is going to be within six weeks. Um, or at least you're going to be ready to do this in six weeks. And that meant we had a lot of active work to do and they needed to show up for the work I was asking for, of them. And it also meant that we needed a spouse to have enough time in therapy and support so that when we came together, we could all talk about this. And so I thought Tammy sort of mentioned that, um, you know, first of all, it's, I think a month is it's not that a month is unreasonable or six months is unreasonable. What's unreasonable is that, is that you don't, don't have a date. You know, if someone said to you in three months on this, provided that happens, this will, you know, that would just, even just having a date would make me feel better. But this kind of, I don't know when it's going to happen or is there something that we need to do? Or So that would be really good to clarify. And the other thing is, you know, are you as a partner in getting your own support? Are you going to partners groups? Are you, because you need a foundation underneath you because you're going to hear things that are really hard and you need to have built that relationship with that woman you see every week in group and you, you know, chat up each other, chat each other up about the issues. So you don't want to do this alone. And, you know, maybe that's one of the things that they're waiting for is for you to get support. I, I don't know. Um, but, um, but both of you have work to do. So um, that's how it happens. And six to eight weeks, I know therapists that say it's going to be a year. I, I just would never keep, want to keep someone waiting that long. Um, anyway, Tammy, anything else? No, I, I think that's, yeah. Okay. Next question. The partner anonymous in the very beginning stages, like days, where can we, I turn to for support, especially with limited resources. I put it in the chat, but sex and relationship healing.com. You're here. There are Keep reading. partner groups. Oh, uh, oh, not just limited resources, but swiftly but sifting, sifting through all the through, oh sifting, sifting through all the info that we need okay in hearing terms i don't understand we are committed and relational we ran into seeking integrity through terry real he has a podcast with dr rob but we are so overwhelmed okay so so is this like you think the next one goes with it too no, i'm not going to worry about that what i'm going to say is okay. that if you can provide a really, you know, we do have so many things going on. And if I think we could say, here's where the podcasts are, here's, you know, and we'll just get a link for each, at least they can find no, the better yet email me because I send out an email oh, and right. podcasts are here, webinars are here, dropping and groups here's are a here. newsletter, we Work send our groups newsletter are here. Out. Yeah, like I, I, I give, because I know it's overwhelming. I did on both of these websites, I did a little tutorial, a couple minutes to help you go through. There's a little video on the homepage of both of our websites that will help you. You can stop it and pause and go, what did she say? Like, it, like I've tried to, and we're going to work on you know more changes too, but I've tried to help people navigate through it, but I know it's overwhelming, but there's a tutorial on the homepages. You can email me. I will give you links that will go exactly where to go. You know, and I even say both of you go to dropping groups. Both of you can listen to the podcast. This is for betrayed partners. So I, I try really hard to help you navigate this because this is overwhelming when you're in chaos, especially very early on, but thrilled you are here. There are betrayed partner groups for you. E email me. I'll put it in the chat. Um, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. And, and I, I will think. do my best to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, and by the way, you can 
right now here, if you have time or we have time, write another note and say, here are the six terms I don't understand, and we will answer you. You know, it's, in fact, it's helpful to other people to hear maybe there's some things they don't understand. So you're always welcome to do that here and now, in addition to dropping Tammy a note. So what else have we got? Mm -hmm. What's next? Okay, the next one is married 53 years, husband in fair recovery, all the right work. Um, uh, NT husband says he stayed in the emotional affair for seven years because it was novelty. It went out of the chat room, phone calls, chat room, sex, masturbation, gifts, etc. No in-person contact, he says. Mm -hmm. Then he went on to meet other women in sexual chat rooms and on to porn. The other women not out of our chat room contact. To me, this should be called just plain addiction, not emotional affairs. Am I wrong in this thinking? So what no, are your thoughts? This is a mess. This is a mess. And I don't, mm -hmm. Tammy, I, with all due respect, I appreciate what you said, not respect to you, but to your partner is I don't think you're getting the whole truth. You know, I think, in fact, I think while he was in his emotional affair, he was also doing all the sexual stuff. And then we wasn't in the emotional affair, he was doing all the sexual stuff. And maybe there was more than one emotional affair. Uh, this is the kind of person who really does need some kind of treatment or intervention. Um, and whether that's, you know, someone that Tammy can recommend or a program, by the way, this is not someone who needs to take a course. This is someone who needs almost like an intervention. Um, so I, I don't know what kind of, and by the way, married for 53 years, Tammy, 53 years, and you're dealing with this now. I am so, so sorry that it's been the majority of your adult life that you've been struggling with this with a partner. And I'm sure there are things you knew and things you just put up with, but here you are and you don't know how to solve this problem. And I am so, so sorry for that. Um, suggest Tammy they should write you <laughs> yeah well yeah th this is one we have an on uh, sex and relationship healing.com tomorrow morning there's the old lady posse they named it um and it is for people who have and it isn't exclusively because they've let you know any betrayed partner in but it was set up initially to be support for those who have been in a longer term relationship most are empty nesters you know that are probably committed to continuing the relationship um but you know what do we do so um so I, 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 yeah, I don't, I, I think he's minimized. You've discovered some, no doubt, um, but there's more to this. And, and the, the challenge is the acting out as painful as it is, is really the symptom. You know, there are underlying issues. I don't know how long he was doing whatever he was doing, or if he was using other things, sometimes it's food, alcohol, you know, I mean, cannabis is out, you know, is crazy right now because it's been legalized, but, you know, but, you know, gaming, gambling, I mean, there's so many forms of smoking, smoking and vaping or a non-smoke, non-vape facility, and that's important, but, you know, so there was, there may be other things, and so I agree with Dr. Rob, this is not, you know, something that, you know, even though our work groups are great, that won't be enough, so him getting really important to help, you know, to, to start to change this, and it's not too late, we, we've had we've had clients over 80 at our treatment program. So I, I look at that as optimistic and, you know, and wanting to make sure that the next bunch of years are, are good and, you know, and have integrity. Yeah. And have integrity. Um, you know, so, but yeah, I'm I, so I also, sorry. I also want to say that it looks like you're getting pushback that this is just emotional affairs. I mean, that was what you asked at the yeah. end. And, yeah. you know, this is not just emotional affairs. This is someone who's really troubled and is, wanting to see it in a certain way. And this is another one of those trust your gut questions. We got a lot of them today, which is this doesn't feel just like an emotional, this feels like a big problem to you. And I trust, I would trust that. I know yes, what the next one I says. Would too. Uh -huh. It was both, both work, work and, and sexual performance anxiety. So to me, there's more going on. By the way, Wellbutrin is not the only medication for anxiety. And there are a ton that you can go through. And you, if you're not getting symptom relief, this I can say, if you're not getting symptom relief, go back to your doctor and say, I'm not fully getting symptom relief. Um, I, I know for me, I took medications for years, they didn't really help. And all of a sudden, I got the right one. And it really helped. But they don't always get it right. There's not, it's not a very good science. Unfortunately, it's not like this is infected, use that antibiotic. Sometimes people really need to go through different medications and it's a drag, but you, you really shouldn't be feeling this level of anxiety. By the way, it's different if you started therapy three months ago versus if you've been working on yourself for a while. Um, if you've been working on yourself for a while and you're still in this place, you know, it sounds like a medical, medical issue. We got well, a few minutes. 
Yeah, we, no, Go I ahead, we got another question, but I have a, a comment and I can't, find, I have a brochure on it around my desk somewhere, but um, I, uh, a few years ago, I was at a conference um, before COVID when you could go to conferences and we're going to go again. Um, but we the, are. Uh, but I, I picked up a brochure on a program where they do um, like, it's like DNA testing to, to help you because everybody's right. different and and to get the right dosage for how your metabolism go it was brilliant so i make nothing i don't even remember the name of the company so i'm not affiliated I with them at all but if you want information i i will pass it on to you uh, you know um so email me um and ask for the um uh that like call it the dna um, medication stuff and i'll know yeah. what you're asking for and tammy we sat in that lecture together and these people basically told us, you know, we can now look at your DNA and we could determine which medication is going to be more effective for you. And I don't know if you've been on any of those Ancestry 23andMe sites, but they're more and more coming up with traits based on, you know, thousands of hundreds of thousands of people's DNA. They're able to see, oh, so many of these people have this particular issue and this kind of depression or this. So she's right. It's really a fascinating. I'm sure it's not cheap. But there is a process where they can identify uh, in a much easier way what will be the most effective drug for you. That was a that was well, a really interesting seminar. It was, you know, because like my metabolism is different than your metabolism, and so you know, and and when when you go to your GP um, and they hand you the same drug that they handed the, you know, uh, you know, they hand it to a two hundred and fifty pound person versus a 120 right. pound person. I mean, all of those things make a difference mm -hmm. in, in what it is. So I think getting, I think it's worth exploring. So, okay, next question. Um, uh, yeah, I would be scared of it too. I don't no, know. I have to like, say yeah. the, 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 the anxious person keeps writing. <laughs> yeah. that's, so the okay, terms, don't take benzos, I, we, you, but there's yeah, lots of yeah, other meds yes. you can take. And 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 work really hard with your sponsor and and CSAT. So somebody asked about the porn because um, you're still doing dopamine drip and not fully happy, joyous and free. So this person, the early person, was asking about terms because you suggested CSAT, Certified Sex Addiction Therapist. We do mention that and we say it enough in passing that we forget that we need to clarify at times. So there are also partner trained specialists. Even with that, though, I do, um, you know, Dr. Rob, I'm going to grab this. Dr. Rob wrote the updated version of the pro dependence book. This is called Beyond the Myth of Codependency now. So that, oops, sorry, I disappeared. Um, so, so this looks at loving someone who's got brokenness from a very different lens than codependency. So, so when somebody is looking for a betrayed partner specialist, I always say, please ask them if they use the pro-dependent lens, not label, um, versus the codependent. So, um, so it really, it, and what you're saying too is he's turned to porn and sex addiction, prior had opiate and alcohol dependency. So yeah. th that is so common, you know, like mm -hmm. using something else. It's whack-a-mole. person that, yeah, yeah. It's like you're mm -hmm. still not addressing the underlying issue. So this will continue until and unless, you know, he addresses the underlying issues. Is it, I think, more painful for partners, you know, when it's sex and porn addiction. Um, although, you know, watching somebody, you know, kill themselves on the installment plan with drugs is also problematic. So, but. Yeah. I want to just say something quickly about CSAT begin the moment mm -hmm. we have, which is, yes, we recommend um, certified therapists because they, it's not just a little thing. They go through almost a year of training and then another year of supervised training. I mean, there is a lot of effort if you want to have this particular degree, but that doesn't mean all of them are good. <laughs> no offense to you right. guys. So no, right. what, I, I was thinking, oh, we should just put up the CSAT you know, information. They can look for anyone in there, but you can find some really not very good people. And that's why Tammy and I do these consultation groups. And you know, we want to know who doing good work out there so and we've known these people a lot of them for many years for the good and the bad so um you know please do reach out to tammy if you want a referral we 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 i would say we cherry pick but we're very careful about who we recommend based on their experience and who we trust well and dr rob mentioned earlier that he does a peer case consultation group that's a weekly group for therapists they they are scheduling their around you know coming to that so that they can continue to learn and grow and i i validate the, their work with that so well, and that's free okay. too yes last okay question. last question 
Hi, Dr. Rob and Tammy. My husband hasn't been to a CSAT for proper assessment. I'm curious what you think. He views porn every so often, even though he's attempted to stop several times and knows that it's harmful for our relationship. He's obsessed about sex, BDSM with me, and it really took over his mind. And he tried to get as much as he could from me. He sexually abused me with manipulation against my will. And he goes into sexual fantasy intentionally throughout the day. What are your thoughts? Why don't you start? To, to, to me, I, well, so first of all, healthy boundaries for you. We like, it's not okay to the manipulation and sex against your will. That's, you know, I mean, that's rape, you know? So, um, so the, he, he, he is, I think in denial, cause he's thinking it's not as bad as, you know, um, uh, and he's not, he hasn't done any of the work. So he's still hanging on to that. So what do you need to do for you, for your safety? Because, um, you know, like it would be okay. I can't be um, close to you when, you know, this is happening. Um, and, and a CSAT is a good CSAT will be proper assessment, but he, going to a CSAT once a week for 50 minutes is not enough. He, sexual fantasy. I mean, that's 24 seven. So, so getting help to get to the underlying issues, you know, we, we do four to five hours of assessment for, for the guys that come to our, our program, because we want to understand what's going on, you know, at least initially you know, before they arrive. So we can really help, you know, plan treatment for them to address those underlying issues. So Dr. Rob. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I mean, my first thought, Tammy, was this is an inpatient residential type case, and that doesn't mean they have the resources or the interest, but this, for anyone else, this is a, because there's multiple issues, there's abuse going on, um, there's yeah. manipulation, there's, you know, there's a multiple issues going on that, that probably have. Oh, he just left. I think he, he does that sometimes where he plays with his um, AirPods and he leaves. So, so you taking care of you getting help and support and oh there you are you want to answer that question but now you have to i know i don't have it in front of me anymore yeah. okay so i'll oh i know what i was going to say is yeah responding to what tammy said i would sit down and make a list of things that are not okay with me you know just make a list and you know again when you're not in one of these situations look i have this set of boundaries i have this set of things that are not okay with me and then you know i'm worried about your safety um, if you don't want to do something, how do you get the, and, and maybe you don't know how to say no to the person you love or whatever, how can you get support and have a, um, a, a prearranged way of keeping yourself safe? And safe means not doing anything you're uncomfortable with. Safe means trusting your gut. And by the way, again, one of the betrayed partners groups have a lot of women, I know it, who would stand up for saying, you call me anytime you feel uncomfortable. You don't have to be alone with stuff like this. Um, but uh, as far as the BDSM stuff, yeah, people have, you know, we don't pathologize that. We don't say there's anything wrong with somebody who likes that. But there's a lot of ways that, that works, which, which involves understanding it. For example, both partners have to agree. Both partners have to agree beforehand. Both partners have to agree, you know, what, li what the limits of that are. Both partners have to agree if something's uncomfortable, when they say no, it means no. That's not what this sounds like. That's this sounds like you're being abused, and he's playing out his fantasies with you. And I'm worried about your safety. So, um, you know, as much as you're able to protect yourself with boundaries, getting support, um, being clear about what you're willing to do and what not do, and what you'll do if you get pushed in a corner, those are all the things that you need to. To and by the way, you can. There's always a door, and you can leave and get in your car and say, "I'm not going to put up with this, and I'm out of here to protect yourself, whatever it takes." Yeah. Um, Call the police you know, whatever you need to do. So, okay. So we, we're done with questions. Sorry. Yeah, 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 it is. It is past. And um, I typed an answer okay. to one person, but sorry. Um, oh, I, I've been saying, no, I don't want to be objectified anymore. It's easy for him to minimize because he was using me to act out using fantasy and claims that, that it, it was not acting out. It is acting out and it's Trust abuse. Your and, gut. Yeah. Yeah. So healthy this boundaries is someone, for you. Way, you need a lot of support and a lot of education yeah. Um, yeah. that you can get out there that is available. Um, yes. So have a good one, Tammy. Okay. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank Bye you, everybody. Now.